All right, ladies and gentlemen, gather round one and all. It's an absolute pleasure to have with us right here a wonderful audience. Thank you all for being here today and for spending your time uh, here this afternoon. We are here at Breaking Barriers from the US to Malaysia, Women Leading Change. It's an absolute pleasure to have every single one of you right here. I'd like to invite our incredible uh, panelists up on the stage. Let's start first with uh, Ms. Kira Yusri. Uh, all right, cool. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can just like uh, take a seat right over there, maybe. Okay, great. So, Ms. Kira Yusri, uh, founder of the legendary democracy promotion uh, phenomenon that is Undi 18 right there. I believe that you brought about the right to vote for millions of Malaysians who otherwise might not be able to vote right there. And thank you for your service to this country, and it's an honor to have you on this panel. All right, cool. And, oh yes, and because this is an alumni event right here, uh, I would say also that uh, Kira graduated from Western Michigan University. She's a senior associate with the Asia Group Advisors, and she leads, well, the Malaysia team in government engagement and also policy analysis, many other things along the way to share, I'm sure, and uh, yeah. So the next speaker I'd like to welcome up to the stage is Ms. Tanya Lee, right here. Tanya, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. All right. After having graduated from Iowa State University with a BSc in Dietetics and Nutritional Sciences, so Tanya worked as a lead dietitian during the Rio Olympics of 2016 and uh, contributed to Malaysia's historic win of five Olympic medals and is a co-founder of the Sports Nutrition Academy. And uh, incidentally, Okay, so some of you may have seen our post. How many of you out there uh, follow our LinkedIn? Anybody? Like show of hands? Oh, oh okay, okay, cool. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, those of you who follow our LinkedIn, you might know that uh, Tanya is part of uh, essentially the, let's see, International Olympic Committee Young Leader Association. I don't know if the association is part of that, but uh, from 2021 to 2024. So, an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, cool. Our next panelist right here is Ms. Sophia Lisa Jamal. Uh, so Sophia, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to have you. So uh, Sophia, incidentally, is, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yep. Sophia is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Pink Collar Employment Agency. So it's a social business dedicated to eliminating worker exploitation and uh, modern slavery in Southeast Asia's domestic work sector right there. So ethical migration, if um, some of you are interested in that, so then feel free to reach out. Sophia is an alumna of Duke University, and the story of how I managed to get her as a speaker was that she was the keynote speaker at US Apps, and uh, right next to Gen and boom, like, suddenly she's here. All right. <laughs> suddenly, yeah, suddenly. She showed up, yes. <laughs> All right, cool. Anyway, so thank you, Sophia. Um, it's an honor to have you. All right, and our next speaker right here is uh, Ms. Ifa, Ms. Nur Latifa Fauzan. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you right here. All right, thank you. All right. Um, actually, Ifa, like, would it be possible for you to sit by me over there? Then maybe then we have our last uh, person. Or is, is this okay? Yeah. Is that the, yeah, yeah. It's not that good. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Now, um, the reason for this will become clear soon. Well, Ifa, we had a, a bit of a fun discussion uh, before this right here, but um, Ifa is a corporate client services manager at Columbia Asia Hospital. She has a bachelor's degree in dietetics, nutrition, and food science from the University of Kentucky, from which she graduated in 2014. Uh, the reason it's interesting is because like, the hospital that she works at is actually the last hospital that I went to. Um, more, more about this later. <laughs> All right. And uh, here we have our incredible uh, lineup right here of uh, ladies right here. And uh, now I'd like to welcome our thorn amongst the roses, <laughs> Mr. Teng Chan Leong, our moderator for today. Uh, Chan Leong, thank you so much for being here. 
and for me, the thorn amongst the roses. <laughs> it's okay, we have, we have two thorns right here. <laughs> so, Chan Liang is an alumnus of Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, recently, in fact, if you're reading the news, was selected as one of Prestige Asia's 40 under 40. Congratulations on your transformative achievement. And now, I don't want to be mansplaining too much right here, and so I have to pass over the mansplaining job to Chan Liang. Chan Liang, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Victor, and thanks a lot to our panel of speakers for your time and for being here. So when we first organized this session, uh, I think it was about a month back, nobody wanted this chair. Every, everyone was too afraid <laughs> that you know, we are going to be moderating a panel of extremely incredible women. But I think today's conversation really isn't about, um, about gender per se. I think a lot of it has to do with roles, whether it's male or female as to do. Um, specifically in transitioning from the education space back in US, whether you work in US following that, or then coming home, and the different hats that you're wearing when you're home too. So we had a little conversation about how, I mean, women is just one, one role you're playing. A lot of you are moms, wife, someone's sister, parent, uh, daughter, etc. So before we go too deep into the conversation, maybe let's start off with a quick introduction from everyone, starting with Kira. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, oh, okay, introduction. Um, okay, so my name is Kira. Uh, I graduated from the States in, I think, fall of 2016, uh, and I came back to Malaysia a couple months afterwards. Um, so for context, I mean, uh, my journey advocacy actually started while I was in the States, and it, was started, and it started in my final semester um, while I was in Michigan. And I think what was the be reason behind we started with the 18 for context, it was the campaign to lower the voting age, was actually when Donald Trump was elected. You know, putting aside the political sentiments and all that, it was really the, there was just so many conversations about politics and policies um, that was going around in our classes, in our lectures. And you know, my, my university was a very small um, Midwestern one, so I was often the only international student um, in the class, right? And, and you know, to see so many of my, my friends talk about politics so casually was a very new experience for me because I did the twinning program, so I did two years in Sunway and two years in WMU. So, and then at the same time, we were also involved with the Malaysian programs uh, through the Malaysian Embassy and Education Malaysia at that time. Um, and you know, I was meeting with all these JPA, Mara scholars, uh, Kazana scholars, and of course all of them were obligated to go back to Malaysia, and I wasn't because I was a private student. But you know, I was just very surprised that these students didn't mind going back, right? And then, so coupled that with a conversation about politics and, you know, we kept asking ourselves, why don't Malaysian students also talk about um, politics this way? And there were two reasons. Number one is that at that time, we had the University and University Colleges Act in Malaysia, which made it against the law to talk about politics, to join politics, or to even talk about anything related to the government. Um, our current youth and sports deputy minister, Adam Adli, is one of the people affected by that law and he was expelled and thrown to jail for speaking out. Ten years later, he got his degree in education um, and now he's a deputy minister. So, all's well that ends well, maybe. But I think, you know, and then secondly, the reason was that we couldn't vote, right? We, we realized that we were one of the only two ASEAN countries that had a voting age of 21. The other was Singapore. So, you know, immediately we were like, we can't be, you know, why, why are youth in Indonesia voting at 17? Why are youth in the Philippines voting at 18? What's, what's wrong with Malaysians that we have to wait till 21 to make a decision? So <clears throat> that's when the campaign started. It was a change.org petition. Um, I think it only has 2,000 plus signatures until today. So it's very sad. Don't, don't go look it up. Uh, <clears throat> there was a kid that was petitioning the long hair in school that had 10,000 petitions. So he's, you know, way more successful than, than, than I am. But uh, we came back and I think what was successful was that through, um, uh, 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 you know, when I was a student is that we worked with Malaysian students in other countries as well. So I, I just heard that, you know, you know um, uh, AUAM worked with NAMSA as well. So I founded NAMSA when I was a student in the States. And through NAMSA, we, got, we were involved with MSGA, the Malaysian Students Global Alliance. 
And at that time, it was only the third year that MSGA was formed. So through the MSGA, we had relationships with Malaysian students in uh, the UK, Australia, in China, Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, uh, and almost every Malaysian diaspora, student diaspora community out there was supportive of ODI 18. Only the student council in Malaysia was not supportive uh, back home. Uh, which, in, as, as if you are involved in local student politics, you will know you will know why. But so I think it's very interesting because Undi 18 was a movement that started by the Malaysian students overseas, which just shows that you don't have to be in Malaysia to care about your country. Malaysians abroad also care about our country, also want to see change. But of course, it took us also coming back to Malaysia to make that change, right? Um, so we came back, you know, after graduation. Um, worked on the campaign 2019, we passed it in parliament, um, and then 2020, I quit my job to do it full time, and we ran student campaigns, student workshops, uh, work with student groups to mobilize young people. And ever since then, we've seen two general elections where young people are able to vote. Um, and, and this has been very controversial, uh, you know, because I think what people don't realize is that Undi ET is not just lower, didn't just lower the voting age, it also allowed for automatic voter registration. So the millions and millions of new voters are not young voters. They are voters above 21 years old. They are voters above 50 years old that have never registered to vote. And they are the reason, you know, we have a very complex political situation now, is what I would say. Uh, so, <laughs> without going into details. Um, but yeah, so, so I think, you know, I, 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 it's very, it's very important to point that out because I think when uh, the election results came about, everyone was of course very shocked and surprised and everyone started blaming young people, which I was like, you know, it's, it's one young people were only one million out of the five million new voters. The other four million new voters are, are people our age, right? 30 years old and above, 40 years old and above. So, you know, I think politics is complex, democracy is complex, um, but what I really appreciated from my time in the States was that I was given the space to think critically about what's around me. I mean, I was the class where, you know, people who voted, you know, very different voting choices or very openly saying we support this and we support that. And instead of like being expelled, we had a discourse about it. We had a conversation, why do you believe in this? Why do you support it? And our lecturers played a role. If it was in Malaysia, lecturers would also be penalized for talking about politics at that time. Um, so, you know, I think that's just a little bit of background of like um, the work that I used to do and I think one of the reasons I was able to do it is because my education experience opened up and I think not, not so much what I studied but the environment that I was in allowed me to uh, try new things without fear uh, and, and without the risk that I was um, that I would face the same way in Malaysia, right? Because we were in our last semester, what can the Malaysian government do, right? They cannot pull us back to Malaysia. You know, they were not paying my fees. Um, we, we had warnings from the Malaysian embassy back then, but what, what can you do, right? So, so that's why we started. We just continued uh, what we were doing, yeah. Nice, Thank, thanks. That's a very, very good intro. And I, I think by the time the Malaysian government back then actually set up a plan to do something about it, Undi Itin would have, would have started anyway, since we're too slow in doing anything, right? <laughs> Next we have Tanya. Hi, hello. You get it? Hello? Hi, my name is Tanya, and uh, I'm currently a sports dietitian for the Sports Nutrition Academy that I co-founded. And uh, I just wanted to share this because uh, we, we, we are both JPA scholars. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and actually, um, uh, right before the voting, right, I, I don't know about you, but, but we, because uh, I always said we have more JPA scholars, and we actually got warning from the government, you know, to not do anything. Oh, I didn't get it. Yeah, you, you were in the <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we were warned. Ah. Otherwise, our scholarship will be, you know, pulled back, and then... Uh, Yep. Actually, I just want to say my co-founder uh, was also an American girl. He was a GPA scholar, so but he was his last semester, and they already paid his fees. So he's like, they, they can't do anything. Yeah. So and they're like, and they want me to go back. So they also bought his flight ticket back already. And I'm like, so he was like, yeah. I'm just saying, GPA scholars was on our side. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how I got into politics, right? I mean, I did my degree in nutrition, and actually, I. 
I came back, I mean, because of JPA scholarship, and I really wanted to go back to the US because I really enjoyed the freedom of speech and being able to, you know, speak out and not being penalized. I mean, I really loved that. And, you know, the moment I came back, it was different, you know, and, and, and so how I got into sport is I, I have been swimming, I was a swimmer. Not an Olympian swimmer, <laughs> uh, but I, I work with uh, Olympians uh, and also I mean state athletes and whatnot. Yeah, so I worked in the National Sports Institute for a while. Then uh, I went to do my masters in sports science, and I came back and I thought, okay, I don't think I want to go back to working in the government sector. I've got very good experience, uh, but I think the support, the support, and also uh, the ability to, you know, push myself further, you know, is not being supported, right? So, uh, me and some of the few who are more motivated and, and gung-ho, we came out, we formed our own company, so we could reach out more to the younger generation, the younger athletes, because nutrition doesn't just start after you win a medal, right? You need to start nutrition when you're younger, like some Somewhere, sometime around your age, <laughs> <laughs> learning, learning what you know are good for you and what's proteins, right? What's carbohydrates and all, not when you are 80 oh, years old. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we thought that we could do more, yeah, and also educating parents on how to uh, cook and how to prepare meals and how to feed their child at home. That is actually nutrition is just a basic fundamental. I mean, sports nutrition is a little bit later on. Yeah, but what we wanted to do was to reach out to the parents at the grassroots levels or at the level where kids are still doing sports for fun, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, and then I'm also uh, the committee the, for the for the AUAM. Yeah, and we are also looking for more new young people. By the way, those who are interested, yeah, please join. Uh, and yeah, that's about me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Sanya. Thanks, so it sounds like it really isn't just nutrition for athletes, for young athletes, right? It sounds like it's nutrition in general because any young children will be playing around, running around. We all start with the basic nutrition because sports is something that you are really specialized in. Right. So if you're if you're not even eating enough, don't even think about don't even need to think about you know strategizing what you do, what how you feel and hydrate or not because your basic needs to be covered first. Right, every athlete is also human first. Interesting. We'll talk a lot more about diets and nutrition in a, in a second. But from one dietitian to another, we have <laughs> Ifa. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Ifa. Uh, so yeah, we both study dietetics, uh, but I focus more into people who are sick, so in the healthcare, in a hospital. She's with the athletes. Um, right now, my focus is more into um, preventing the sickness like uh, pre-diabetes, uh, diabetes and uh, heart attack, stroke. Uh, currently, the numbers uh, is just in keep on increasing in Malaysia and it's very scary. So we work very closely with a lot of corporates to combat this problem because uh, right now, uh, thankfully, a lot of uh, private corporates in Malaysia also they start to like care, they start to have this awareness. They just tell us like, oh, we got two stuff that just uh, have stroke and they just drop and we don't know what to do so this kind of thing they start to realize we need to look into the, the diet exercise the, the mental health actually COVID also helped with the mental health a lot of companies now more aware so now like the, the opportunity is there um, the awareness is there we just need to push it forward a bit more aggressive because um, now of course there's a cost and everything also right but we also work with uh, insurance and DPA when they look at like uh, how much does it cost when you already sit versus when you're preventing it. Mm -hmm. That's where they see the numbers and also the implication when you're sick. But yeah, I guess uh, that's too much into it. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much like where where I'm getting into. But I used to uh, consult patient also uh, back then, and it's very sometimes things that we think as basic for Malaysians. A lot of Malaysians, it's not basic for. Them. like things like carbohydrate protein <coughs> things it's very different because when you when I when we're in the States right uh, and you talk to a lot of uh, girls in general like our age they know because they also have the body image but in Malaysia generally we don't really have the same culture so the the sense of urgency is not really there also in the same time. Yeah. 
Okay, that's all from me for now. <laughs> thank, thank you, Bob. We're gonna hear a lot more about taking care of pre preventive nutrition, um, specifically for adults, and making sure they don't fall sick. Right? I think we're gonna go a little bit deeper into that. We'll also discover more about Ifa's other roles as a competitive athlete. Still, <laughs> but last but not least, we have another co-founder, which is uh, Sophia from Pink Color. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sophia. I graduated from Duke University in 2017 and I studied public policy and innovation and entrepreneurship. Before that, I was um, a scholar at the United World College, I'm not sure whether you're familiar, and I went to the one in Hong Kong. And I share that because that was my first kind of exposure to the problems of human trafficking. At the time, I was primarily working with children who were um, trafficked for, unfortunately, like sexual, um, yeah, the, the sexual industry. So um, I studied in the US I, and for four years, and I was actually I was very happy to come home. <laughs> I I interned for um, Dr. Ong Kian Ming um, in twenty, I think twenty sixteen. Um, and I yeah, returned home and I actually started work at Kazana. So I wasn't a Kazana scholar, but I was quite interested in like nation building at the time and I was in the responsible um, investment unit um, where I was trying to create policies to introduce ESG considerations into the investment process. Um, but Quite early on, I did feel a little bit out of place. I was always kind of joked, uh, when my colleagues used to like tease me and say I was a socialist in the team. So I was like, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I, yeah, so in, 20, in 2018, I met my co-founders. So in 2019, I officially left Kazana and we co-founded an ethical recruitment agency or social business that um, ensures that female workers primarily who enter Malaysia to work in the domestic work industry or as domestic helpers are not trafficked into the country. Um, they have channels to um, safe and legal um, jobs in Malaysia um, and ensuring that they also work in non-exploitative conditions. So in um, Malaysia, for those who may not be aware or familiar, a lot of workers still today don't have very basic provisions such as access to their phones or their personal identity documents and even the ability to leave the homes that they work in. So many times they would stay um, at home for two full years or only be able to leave the households with their employers. And because of my experience um, in Hong Kong as well, for me, these practices felt very much like modern day slavery. Even though in Malaysia it's very normalized and it just, I think many people are acquainted with this issue, but they don't see it from that lens. Lah. So I think that's one. Um, introduction, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that was the company that um, I co-founded. Uh, we'll go into it a little bit more, but I want to share with Tanya and Ifa that the first ever class I took in diet and nutrition was in the US. So I would say that was the advantage of a liberal arts education. That's when I learned um, that uh, vegetables are also carbohydrates. I believe, yes. Um, in, in, before that, I was like, it's a separate um, entity. Um, and that's when I realized that I need to actually um, mon like monitor my sugar levels. So thankfully, at the age of uh, 20, I was already exposed. <laughs> well, at the age of 33, I learned, <laughs> I learned that plants is also carbohydrates. <laughs> well, today I learned. Right, so when I first got the panel, I think one of the first things that came to mind was, how am I going to navigate this session, right? Because we have everything from politics and voting agenda to athletes, uh, patients, adults, and then to domestic workers, which are four very different categories. But then I thought one thing that tie everything together is surprisingly myself, right? So as as an individual, as a Malaysian, I guess I am a voter, I am a parent, I am a hopefully not a patient, but <laughs> someone who's interested in taking care of my health. And, and also an employer of, of migrant worker, right? So I thought that my perspective would be, would be a relevant context to tie everything together. So today is about me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so today is about barriers. I think, uh, like I mentioned at the start, I really don't want to skew today's conversation to just gender as a barrier. I feel like across the different complex contexts and complex industry that you're all serving, there are many, many barriers to, to do that. And sounded like from most of the introduction, 
there is a certain frustration that drove you to do uh, what, what you do. Right? So maybe starting from uh, Kira again, what were some of the barriers you had? Um, maybe the obvious one and also some of the not so obvious one that people may not think about. In politics. Yeah, in starting with really 18. <laughs> <laughs> Barriers in politics, I think it's, it's too many to list down. Uh, I was just doing another webinar right before this panel talking about barriers of politics for young people. And I think for women, young women especially, you are, you know, you, you're double marginalised in a way that, I mean, Malaysian politics is a given, we're very feudalistic, right? Our political system runs on patronage, um, regardless of whatever party you are in. Um, I think what has we see, you know, in, in Malaysia compared, you know, in comparison to like the U.S. politics, that ours across the political parties, you don't see actually very different ideological differences, um, and which is why today, if you have where we have a unity government, there's not many clashes of economic policies in the end, but we differ in terms of how we view identity politics, and that's how the lens that we see in, uh, Malaysian politics, and that's why. <coughs> One of the biggest barriers uh, for us to enter politics or even to run a political active advocacy group is our identity, right? For me, I am, um, I mean, I'm a woman. My co-founder is an Indian guy. Um, so, you know, it already, like, marginalized, like, like quite badly, right? In, in, the, in the political scene, you, you don't see. I think now we only have one. One, uh, we, do have, we don't have a single female Indian MP at the moment, yeah. Last, last time we had Kasturi and then she didn't contest, so now we have zero. We have zero Indian women representation uh, in the Malaysian parliament. Um, and then another problem that we have in Malaysia in politics is that similar to many other Southeast Asian countries, we, are a, we have a problem of with political dynasties on both sides of the political aisle. And it's the same problem in Indonesia, same problem in Thailand, same problem in the Philippines. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, in the Philippines, they are trying to push actually a political dynasty law to prevent. Because it, it, it's quite bad there in the sense that the mayor is your father-in-law, then the deputy mayor is your brother-in-law, then the councillor is like your son-in-law or something like that. So, so when you know, sometimes I meet, because my work, I, you know, some, I, I do some regional work and I meet young councillor and he's like, I have no hope. Because if, I'm, if I'm, not, I'm not part of this family, I will never rise up in politics. And it's the same, same in Indonesia. Just last two weeks, you know, young people in Jakarta was protesting because uh, Jokowi tried to, you know, overrule the courts, which has his, like, brother-in-law or something, and then, you know, they tried to, to amend the law to put, make sure that his sons are in, uh, in, in qualify for, for uh, uh, roles in government. So, it's, it's, it's insane, right? And then not to mention, I think, as uh, Malaysian, the general public have an idea of what a Malaysian should look like. So they have an idea of what a young Malay woman should look like, which I clearly don't fit in that mold. Um, so when we first started with the 18, which was largely an online campaign, I think you see the worst of Malaysians online sometimes. Um, I'm sure if you work in like migrant workers, right, you can see the xenophobia online. But and, and in Malaysia, the racism and sexism that the people articulate online is really, really bad. You know, I, I used to talk about because um, I did uh, my degree in gender studies in the States. So we had the worst combo for Malaysian. Uh, so, you know, why, why study about women? Who cares? You know, and, and I would post about my experiences uh, over there. And they were like, oh, kenapa awak nak belajar ajaran sesat? You know, this is the American agenda. You're going to bring back liberal minds and liberal thoughts into our political system and corrupt all the young people. Um, and, you know, I think when you are 21 years old, it does get to you, right? What these people say online. I mean, now, now, it, does, it, it, it doesn't affect me, but I, had, I, I went through therapy, I went through, I have support groups, I have a very strong community, um, other female activists that go through the same thing. So, I think for, you know, for young people who want to go in this field, you have to, unfortunately, be prepared to have all these perceptions and assumptions made about you. I think that's one of the biggest challenge when you are doing advocacy work because you're putting yourself in the public eye and I think if you don't prepare yourself for it you're gonna um, you know face this all of this like uh, a backlash and you know I think it is it's very crazy how I I've, you know people can have entitlement towards your lives um, or assumptions and briefly in 2022 I was working in frontline politics um, I took a break from only 18 I was uh, sex addicts chief of staff and campaign manager I quit right after elections, uh, which says a lot, right? Like the moment elections, we, we won the election, I was like, 
I'm going to corporate, so good luck. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, so I think you know, being being in the room with like uh, uh, senior politicians who are now ministers, by the way, was incredibly eye-opening for me, and not in the most positive way either, right? I think being being young already puts you at disadvantage, you know, in this in this situation, and they're always the whole we know better than you, you know, we've experienced life more than you. Um, and then, of course, uh, as a young woman, and even sometimes being an overseas grad would also work against you in situations, right? Because they're like, oh, you're so privileged, you will not know what's going on on the ground. I mean, to a certain extent, that's true. I don't deny that, right? But we're all very different people, right? How are we going to get all these Malaysians to come back and serve the country if you also belittle, um, you know, what, what they think about Malaysia and how to improve Malaysia? So I think, you know, fundamentally, uh, barriers to politics, to elections, even to a certain extent to activism in Malaysia, very much ties to uh, your identity and what they assume you represent. Um, you know, there was a time when uh, 2021, when uh, the lockdown was going on, I was part of the movement that was protesting against the government, and <clears throat> there was some Malay tabloids. Uh, online looks like soya chinchao type of like Facebook page. I'm not sure if you guys are aware. Yeah, and they would like put my picture and WMU's photo and the American flag and then all the NGOs that I used to work with, which is not even political, like Teach for Malaysia and all that. And they'd be like, oh look at like they're like bringing liberal ideas. You know, they're probably paid by the CIA and all that. And I was like, I wish, right? Like then we wouldn't be so poor. You know, crowdfunding for like face masks and hand sanitizers to keep people alive. Like, if only we were paid to do all these things, you know? We couldn't, when we were protesting, our speaker died because we couldn't buy battery. <laughs> so, so, you know, it doesn't make money. So I think, I think, but, but it goes, you know, peop, and my parents who were living abroad saw those posts, saw those like pictures and, and posters, and they're like, what are you doing? You know, so yeah, my parents live overseas, so they have no idea what I do in Malaysia. I mean, until I got to the media. But, so, I think for, for young people, if we don't have a community that supports us, I think a lot of us would have given up a long time ago. Um, so I was very lucky. But I think as times change and the way we do advocacy goes online, it gets much tougher, I think, for it to be sustainable. Yeah. Right. We're going to talk a little bit more about support and overcoming the, the barriers in, in, the, in the next round. But speaking of barriers, I think for, 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 both, for both of you, what, what is the barrier for your industry? Uh, maybe starting with you. You know, Malaysians have very good food. We are blessed. We are, we are blessed with um, a lot of very delicious food, very good food. But um, actually, to be honest, right, nutrition, this nutrition degree, I feel that it's the opposite. We have probably 90-95% of uh, people who graduate in nutrition are female. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and a small handful male. Uh, and but But, the tables uh, turn a little bit for sports. sports. So sports nutrition, we have more, we see more male nutritionists, more male dietitians working in this industry. And actually, for for what I do when I work with athletes, I'm not alone. But maybe for the team, I'm the only sports nutritionist and dietitian. Whereas the rest are male. The physiologist, the strength conditioning coach, the coach, um, psychology is a half half fifty fifty, right? We have male female. So. Uh, yeah, I mean the biggest barrier is definitely the good food, which is great. Uh, I mean, we have so many choices, but we're spoiled for choices at the same time. Uh, but the other thing, uh, I mean, I'll talk about sports more, right? The other thing is uh, the perception, because we were not taught, I mean, proper nutrition from young. Mm -hmm. So each family, each household, I mean, food to us is very personal, our taste, our, our, our preferences. So when we give certain education, we have to be really tactful and to really understand the person as a whole, how the food interacts and how the food affects that person. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes our recommendation may not fit into what they have been taught for a long time, right? Uh, and in sports, usually the people who come to see us is when they are really desperate. Mm -hmm. They're like, I don't know what else I should do anymore. So that's why I come to see you. Uh, but actually, this all starts way before, right? I mean, I don't have the magic pill for you. If I have the magic pill, you already, you know, look positive, <laughs> banned from the sport, right? But, so yeah, I mean, 
sport is, I mean, it's great that they approach us, uh, even though at the wrong time, but now people are getting more and more aware as athletes are being more and more open and like, hey, you know, you know how, that's how they eat, especially the, 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 the American athletes uh, or uh, British or European and Australians actually. So our Malaysian athletes are getting more and more aware. It's just that for them to come and approach us, they are still hesitant into, you know, they, they feel like they know more, which is, which is great, which is okay. Uh, but again, uh, not everyone has the right concept or know. Like for example, you know, you didn't know that vegetables also have carbohydrates, right? And same for my father, right? He, uh, he is pre-diabetic and he still eats a lot of fruits and he keeps asking me, why is my blood sugar not going down? There's sugar in fruits too. <laughs> but he thought it was healthy, so he ate so much, right? Yeah. I learned another thing today. <laughs> I mean, but jokes aside, it really goes to show the, the lack of education, right? And by many metrics, I will be considered an educated urban uh, crowd. And even I am so uneducated about nutrition and what all this means. Right? Maybe another follow-up for, um, for Tanya. What, what do you think is the biggest misconception that you have seen, uh, at, at least among the, the athletes, right? What do they think? You know, they keep doing it and then realize actually it's the opposite of what they thought it would do. Oh, should I say this? Okay. okay. And, it's also, and, it's, no, 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 and it's also education, right? Uh, sports drink actually, there's all these sports uh, drink company. They actually done, they have done a lot of research. research. Being a sports scientist myself, I, I mean, I've looked through all the papers and all that. And the reason why the sports drink have certain composition, the amount of carbohydrates, five to eight mm. grams of carbohydrate per 100 meals, and uh, 45 to 60 minimum of sodium, you know, in there. There's a certain reason why sports drinks are called sports drinks because they they get to get into your gut faster, the fastest, right, and into your into your um, bloodstream and into the muscles. You don't drink sports drink after your exercise. You're already done. <laughs> All right? You need to drink before or during. And even, let's say, if you're not able, and this happens to a lot of uh, adult athletes, by the way, uh, <laughs> I mean, not her, but uh, you know, a lot of us, she, she was in, she's in flag football, right? So a lot of adult athletes, is, they don't have time to eat before the training. It's very common. Same for school-going children, they don't have time to eat, right? From school, immediately you have to rush for training. No time. So then we suggest, okay, things like sports drink or things that are more carbohydrate-based or more simple sugar-based, yeah, even for fruits, it's also okay. But a lot of the parents would think like, ah, sports drink is not good, or even Milo. Milo is good, it's great, it's great. You can fuel yourself quickly before the training. Right. You must know when's the purpose of what you eat. Then it makes sense, right? So, yeah, the sports drink is the biggest one. <laughs> See, you, really, really, right? I thought they placed the Gatorade machine at the exit when you are tired. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, they're putting it in the, at the entrance. Yeah. It just so happened to be at the same place. Oh my god, boom. Right. So, um, for adults then, um, what was the barrier for them? I, we, we, talk about, we talk about habit and schedule and busy, um, busy schedule as one of the biggest barrier, but what, what else do you think was the barrier for people to stay healthy? Especially in the context of uh, prevention for, for yourself. Okay, so funny story about <laughs> adult uh, athletes, right? So I play uh, American flag football competitively and uh, so we know that people are not really eating well and they're all 20 above years old. And uh, sometimes when I have casual chat like, oh, how's your uh, time there? Oh, I'm so tired. Like, oh, what time did you eat? What did you eat just now? Oh, I didn't eat today. And I'm like, but you train until like 11 p.m. And then uh, the coaches all start to realize that we have this problem and we train like insane uh, a lot of times in a week. And then, then I remember Tanya, so I was like, maybe we should bring Tanya here. <laughs> if, I, if I advise people, I cannot train. Like, so like, okay, then like she came in, so like she would be like uh, teaching the basic, like having classes, so, which is great. And uh, when I talk to most of the players, they generally don't have the basic understanding of when they should eat, what they should eat, for what purpose. Uh, and then they start to eat the wrong thing at the wrong time and then they can't perform or they just can't play. Like the, the, the benefit of the nutrition is not there. It's supposed to enhance the performance, but now it's like stopping them from perform or train better. That is like for uh, various for adults. For general population, 
a cultural perception also plays a part. Because for example, if I go to uh, like a normal wedding in like uh, Malay, so you know, and then if, if I if some aunties they see me, they think, oh, why are you so skinny? Like like they would have that perception. They think that you're unhealthy. Like, unhealthy. And I sometimes I'm second guessing myself. Am I? <laughs> Like no, like I'm, I'm healthy. Like I just feel like because everyone else is overweight, is considered like okay and normal. Then when you are at normal BMI, is considered like you are not normal. So the the perception that even my parents like, my parents like, I promise I'm healthy, mom. <laughs> yeah, those kind of thing. Uh, but the biggest barrier. Yeah, because family, your family, family. They never, they never trust whatever you say. Just like I'm just gonna have my friend to consult my family. <laughs> so, um, but I can imagine it's the same thing in uh, healthcare, uh, in a hospital setting. Usually, um, you see a lot of uh, misconceptions uh, earlier on, or when they are, as she said, when they're already desperate, they already have like the sugar is so uncontrolled, and they come here, and the doctor already been yelling at them many times, so they just come to us. So we are the person that they tell everything, they spill everything. Because we are with them for 40 minutes, sometimes one hour, consultation with a dietitian. So we play bad cop, good cop with the doctor. So the doctor will be the bad cop. We will be the good cop. So we get into all the secrets and what they do every day. And then we find out, oh, they do this, 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 this. So it comes down to personality of the patient also. Every patient you approach differently. They have different uh, willingness on how much they want to tell you. We just have to know like uh, how to you know, reach out to that spot, like, like how to talk to them, how to get them on your side so you can help them. Because mm -hmm. uh, also most people, they just want to tell you what they do good. What they don't do good, they don't tell you. But then you look at the lab result, you look at everything like that, it doesn't match. Whatever that you say and what's on the paper, it don't match. Like when you go for the health checkup and the doctor asks you, do you, are you a frequent drinker? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not for the past week. <laughs> Not for this morning, right? So I think one of the, the points you mentioned was cultural context and it's about the food that we cook and the food that's available. And I mean, one of, one of my personal problems was when I had adult money, I want to eat whatever I want, right? And whatever that's available that I want in Malaysia, it's like the roti chanais and you want to have unlimited amount of it. You want, it's the KFCs, it's the curries, it's, it's everything that's delicious, but not necessarily the most nutritious or balanced. But in, in the larger scheme of things, right, how, how do we reconcile that difference? Because I think it would be impossible for us to say, let's make a healthier, balanced version of nasi lemak. And everybody just subscribe to that. I think Malaysians, that culturally is a hard shift. Probably harder than getting them to vote, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, like our food generally, it's uh, how we make it, it, it's based on the kind of ingredients that we have. Uh, tropical ingredients, right? All the uh, coconut milk, santan, all the oil, the way we cook, it's, it's based on that. It's technically, yeah, there are people coming up with a healthier version, but you can tell, as a Malaysian, that's not how it's supposed to taste like, right? Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of like, it's a turn off, like you don't feel the satisfaction. So for me, uh, how, I would, how I would advise my patient usually, like you can eat those, but you just need to understand how to take it in a moderate portion, right? And how frequent you are. So, for example, like Teh Tarik, right? Like, even I love Teh Tarik. Like, I would never tell myself never have Teh Tarik at all. So, I ask them usually like, okay, in a week, how many times do you drink Teh Tarik? So, if you have to cut 50% of your whole week allowance, right? Is that okay with you? If 50% not okay, then we negotiate. Like, at what point that you're willing to give in and then slowly kind of like, you know, reduce it. Same goes to like uh, nasi lemak or uh, roti chanai. So for roti chanai, we, we just see like, okay, how many times can you take it? And what else can you take with that so you feel fuller to prevent you from taking another meal like one or two hours later? If you just take nasi lemak, uh, roti chanai and teh tarik, you'll be hungry like two hours later. And you eat something else that's higher in calorie. So total up in one day, you're already exceeding your total calorie. So take like some protein with that uh, roti chanai, so like some chicken curry on the side. Which is funny, another funny story, I go to Mama, right? 
So when I say, I always add protein in my whatever roti that I have, so I feel fuller and that's my full meal. And the mama always assume like, when you say you want curry chicken, just the, the gravy. Oh, yes. Just the curry. Without the chicken, right? And then they think they're just the gravy. And I'm like, but I need the protein. <laughs> so you actually have to tell them, like, ah, the chicken also with the gravy, because it's very common to just dip in the gravy. So that's also another thing that, a little thing that you can do that makes a big difference in your appetite and in the whole day, how much calorie that you're eating at the end of the day. Right. Impressive. So moving on to a completely different industry, I think the barriers are even, even more ingrained. Like you said, it's been generations of how people live with meat, grow up with meat, or, or domestic <coughs> workers. And, you know, they, they might be exposed to, like yourself, they might be exposed to everything, but that's not how you see a maid at home while you're growing up. That's not how you see your friends uh, when they had domestic worker or domestic help. So in your case, what's the barrier to, accept it, to, to accepting ethical uh, hires? Yeah, maybe I can just start by sharing that um, when my co-founder and I started the organization, we were very um, conscious that we were not the typical profile of an agency owner. So in Malaysia, the agency owners tend to be a lot older, the old generation, like in their 50s or 60s. Um, and when we first started, I remember this moment, we were in the Philippines Embassy, having a focus group, just to learn about what uh, programs the embassy um, uh, arranges for the workers in the country. There were, I think, 10 other agency owners, and we walked in, they said, you're in the wrong room, because they really were shocked that we were agency owners. They said, why are you here? And then we had to do a bit of introduction, and when they found out that, you know, both me and my co-founder, we had studied abroad, they had this impression that this is not where you're supposed to be. You know, they were kind of advising us, like, like parents, hey, you study abroad, you come back here, you run a main agency, a very headache business, you know, like, don't do it, you know. Like, um, just trying to dissuade us. Um, but I do think that our, the fact we were young actually was an advantage because we, I think we saw things differently, so we could bring different perspectives. And currently, we sit actually on the committee for all of the agencies in Malaysia. And we are the youngest committee member, lah, so they kind of see us as different and they and we haven't kind of burned bridges last so in that way we can learn from each other um, but I think the hardest thing is that and, and it's something that we learned along the way when we first when I first came back from the US you know you're talking about exposing yourself to like liberal ideas um, when I first came back we learned that one of the biggest mistakes you can make when you are advising an employer to do things the right way is to actually mention the word human rights never mention the word human rights <laughs> um, it's like it's going to be a huge turn off for them. They will immediately say like, okay, bye. Okay, so what we um, try to do is move away from the jargon of human rights because many Malaysians in schools, we don't learn about it, right? Talk about political awareness, even concepts like justice. Um, you know, we don't hear about that. We don't learn that in school. So I feel like we have a system, systematic problem, systemic issue, and it's not that Malaysians are inherently bad people or they want to do evil things. But they've never ever been exposed to these concepts. And like what you said, generation after generation, you grow up and you see how your parents treat workers, um, and you just assume that's normal, right? So what we do is we try to connect to our employers um, in a just a very human-to-human, common-sense level. So we might say, hey, um, if your worker is um, working without a phone, which is very normal in Malaysia, a lot of workers, are not, they don't even hold their own phones, so the traditional agencies would advise employers, take away her phone, and once a month, give her like an hour to call her kids. And it's kind of wild to think about it, because especially in today's world, everyone uses phones all the time. It's almost like difficult to imagine your daily life without a phone. But it, traditional agencies would advise clients to do that. So, we, so clients will ask us, hey, your agency allow phone or not? Like, they just ask us like that. And we'll say, yeah, actually, like, um, we have an ethical hiring pledge. If you want to use our services, you need to allow your worker to hold a phone. But we'll try to connect with them, like, hey, can you imagine if you work one full month, you don't have access to your phone? Can you work productively? Can you work sustainably? And we know we remind them that it's quite um, expensive, right, to hire a worker. And if you want your worker to renew her contract with you, you are, I mean, you, to do that, you, you need to give her a work environment that is sustainable. So we use these type of terms, right, to help them see it. Or we can say, hey, you know, she hasn't seen, she won't be seeing her children. Can you imagine not talking to your kids for two full years or once a month? 
that would be very unsustainable. A lot of them are married and no marriages can sustain on that basis as well. So um, trying to speak to them in that way, um, using non-human rights language is one of our methods. Um, and I think what I've noticed is that maybe like 50% of clients that um, first hear about our services may not be open to it, but once they try to imagine themselves in the worker's position, a lot of them actually change their minds. And I mean, we understand, I think that um, Malaysia is also very unique in that we do have a huge problem with um, illegal migration um, and also this issue of abscondment, which, or in other words, workers running away. So a lot of times, employers feel like they have to use restrictive practices to retain workers in jobs. So one of our methods to help clients change their mindsets is also to ensure that we try our very best in all legal means to reduce termination rates and to increase retention rates because we also understand for employers if a placement doesn't succeed, it's also very costly and expensive and you might know as an employer yourself. So um, yeah, I think one of the barriers is that many Malaysians are just not introduced to these concepts and so we need to meet them where they are and I think I hear very similar parallels to what you're doing as well, right? Like, tell, meet them halfway, you want your eat chana, you can still eat your eat chana. <laughs> but like, how to eat it, you know, in what um, frequency and how to pair it with other types of um, proteins, I think that's kind of what we try to do as well. We try to meet people halfway. And importantly, we, we don't, we, we have a very strong culture code in Pink Collar that we don't judge people, you know? We, we try to um, change the market with hope and inspiration than alienation. So, yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. Mm. And keeping the mic on uh, with, with you, mm. one, one last question before we wrap it up and we do only have one minute each. Mm. So, at the end of the panel, I, I don't want us to sort of just discuss and everyone just walk away with somewhat of a better understanding. I do want them to be able to take home something that they can act upon, mm. right? If I have a daughter today, you know, what's the one thing I must go home and tell them today? You know, if I meet a young woman today, and this is the only, I guess, the only question that will try, tie back to young girls, right? If you meet you know, a younger version of yourself or let's say a teenager version of yourself, what's the one advice you would give to them? And that's you know, independent of your industry or your field. <laughs> <laughs> this question was not in the, in the FAQ, right? So <laughs> they were all not prepared. If you see a teenage version of yourself, you know, what's the one advice you would give to them? Um, two things I would say. I think one is I would say, um, and I think this is what the US education helped me with as well, is to not take things at face level, at face value, and to whatever you see around you that may seem normal, take some time, digest the idea, and think, hey, like, is this all there is to it? Because I think in society today, we take too many things for granted and it's too normalized. But if you really think about it, you might realize there's some not really right here, right? right? So take the extra effort to observe and not take things at face value. Um, I think that's one. Um, I think secondly, I would say surround yourself with other people who also care about things that are bigger than themselves. I think especially for younger women like, who want to do challenging work like we all do and uh, you know I think uh, Kira you mentioned it is very emotionally draining and it's sometimes doesn't feel sustainable so it's very important to find a community that generally does feel hopeful as well and tries to see the good out of very difficult and dark times which if you're doing anything that is very hard um, there will be difficult moments so I would say from a young age you get used to finding those people and build those friendships and communities. Because it takes time and I think that it's not something that I was thinking about very consciously. I'm very lucky that it so happened to be that I had formed friendships that I could rely on later in this way. But if I were younger, I would maybe think intentionally about that and be a little bit more discerning when um, picking my community. Mm. Oh, that's great. That's great. I can go next. Yeah, yeah because uh, what Sophia said actually is very relevant, but not not uh, in my, not so much in my industry, but more for being a mother because I felt that motherhood nowadays are very different from before, right? Before mothers would have like, uh, oh, sorry, a household would have so many kids, right? And now 
Like even for me, having two kids, I'm like struggling. <laughs> and really, you know, you, you, you really reach out to friends who are parents or new parents or even uh, have taken care of kids for support. Yeah, so, you know, finding people who are, who can, who are positive and being able to support you, that really helps because, I mean, now we're talking about mental health. I think a lot of mothers are also, you know, in that in that phase, especially new mothers. So I also try my best to reach out to my friends who are new mothers because they may not know what to do. Yeah, and I was lucky enough to have a lot of support from my friends who reach out to me, and that's what I wanted to do for them. Um, but in terms of word of advice, uh, I would always say, I mean, for my younger self, to always be assertive, and that's what I really took home uh, assertive and confident. That's what I took home from being in the US because when I was back in Malaysia, it was always, you know, in a classroom, you're always being told what to do mm -hmm. rather than you get to think uh, by yourself, like what you can do, mm -hmm. how you can become. It was more like, okay, you do this, you do that, you do that. You have to do like that, like this, this, this. And then when I go to the US, I realized you can, it doesn't work this way. <laughs> and I, I'm from a Chinese school, right? So it's very like, uh, you don't do this, you cannot rotan. <laughs> and I did, yeah, I cannot rotan so many times, I was so scared. <laughs> yeah, and I'm doing it, I'm listening to the teacher because I'm afraid, not because uh, I want to. Uh, yeah, so being in the US, I realized that I have to stand up for myself. You know, you have, I have to be confident. Uh, I have to find different ways, right, to, to, to bring myself out and to think. Yeah, so uh, whenever I talk and go, you know, you have to be really assertive yeah, and always be curious, curious uh, in my profession because sometimes some, someone might say something differently and you might think differently so in, to avoid conflict or avoid uh, ju judgment comment, you always be curious and asking, oh, what do you think about this? Why do you, why do you say like that? And, and, and that can help in terms of um, the relationship between me as a dietitian as well as the client or the athletes. That's impressive. Kira or Ifa? Yeah, I think I have two things, I guess. I would say, I would tell my younger self, every leap of faith is worth it. Um, I think, you know, I made so many decisions, like, to choose to quit my job, choose to start something crazy, choose to continue it. Um, despite it all, you know, it's always it's a leap of faith every time. And I think similarly, you know, if you start a business, you start a social enterprise, it's, it's, it's a similar, right? But at the end of the day, there's only two outcomes. Either you succeed or you, have, you learn a very good lesson. So every leap of faith is worth it. Choosing to come back was a big leap of faith, right? Like I could have settled in the States, right? My parents didn't really care or didn't pressure me. Yeah. Second thing was I think you start therapy early. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm a big advocate for therapy now. I think a lot of young people today, we have so much expectations on us. Um, and, and, you know, just because, you know, we're Asian doesn't mean we can't talk about our feelings, right? And, this is, and, you know, with resources today, we are able to access affordable mental health care, especially if you're in, in, in Klang Valley. So, I, you know, I think, especially for activists, we underestimate how much it would affect us personally. I only started therapy after I was facing uh, police harassment, and it was with, uh, and even then it was because a mentor was like, okay, I can't even help you in this conversation, so I'll help you pay for a therapy that's focused on human rights defenders. So, you know, so you know, they would know exactly what sort of intervention you need, and then later on I moved to um, you know, it tapered off into, into a, a regular therapy session here. But, you know, the point is, actually, there are so many tools out there to help us cope with the different challenges in life. And just because you're an activist, you, 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 don't, you cannot put others before yourself, even though that's what people expect you to do. Um, and if you don't take care of yourself, you know, no one's going to do it for you. You have to do it for yourself first. And mental health is the number one thing that's so, so important, I think, to, to all of us, yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> no, no, because uh, Iowa State, we have free, as uh, we, we pay student services free, but it, it, we have free psychological, you know, so many services that we get, but I didn't actually see a psychologist or therapist until I was attacked at my house. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the university called and said, hey, uh, we have free services, you, you, you must go and see one time, mm -hmm. and you can decide to continue or not. So after that one time, 
I really liked it and I thought that that really, really helped. And that was my last semester. I only had one semester. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make full use of the services. <laughs> so sad, but yeah. That's good advice. And last but not least, Eva. Um, I think like if I were to go back to tell myself, I would just be telling me that it's okay to want to do something different and be innovative and just do something that people will be questioning you back, like why are you doing this? Because even like right now with what I do, um, in healthcare setting you understand it's just like sick people come, we chop 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 in surgery table and then you do medication, <laughs> you go home, <laughs> right? That is like how traditionally how it has been. But now if you want to put a new idea on like, uh, say like a preventive care program, wellness, so I would be doing all the groundwork of uh, reading all the practice guidelines, looking for which doctors I can work with, looking for which nurses I can work with, and coming up with the whole program and the layout and trying to push this to the hospital, look, we are going to do this. But people would be like, what? In normal basis, we just take patient and then treat them and then they go out. That's how we do, right? But now we're doing something different that everything different people feel like, why are we doing this? Yeah. Like, right? So you get that resistance. It's very common. So back in the days when I was younger, I hope I'm still young. <laughs> <laughs> at, at the time, I always feel like, you know, it kind of scare you a little when you're younger. But as you get older, you'll be like, no, like, like we should do this. And then when you get the support, necessary support that you need, so I'm very grateful because uh, Columbia Asia has very, been very supportive on a manager, management level and we are really trying to push this out there and I feel like it's great to really like be doing something new and then pushing it out there. It's difficult and challenging but we're going to make it happen out there sooner or later. So the advice, the advice would be to be brave to embrace new. Yeah. Good, good. Before we wrap it up, I think we definitely want to open up the Q&A's to the floor. I'm sure many of you would have questions. I see one hand about to pop up. Let me pass your mic. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aurora. Thank you for the wonderful sharing. I feel very inspired. And actually, I have two questions. The first one is general. As a young girl, I always have this question. Is should we commit to marriage or family in the early of the life? Because the bad end of the story is that I have a friend who finished her master's in 25 in education and she went for interview to, for a lecturer but when the HR see her engagement ring then people will always ask, are you planning to get married? And all the, all the interviews that she wore the ring, she never called, uh, get the call back and the two offers that she gets, she never wears the ring. So she posted something on the Instagram story like never wear engagement ring and never tell people that you are planning to get married if we want to have our career. Because I understand that biologically, if you want to have kids, it should be like around 30 years old. But if like for example, she finished her master in 25, 26, it might be her first job. And yeah, so this is the first question, it's general. And then the second question will be uh, uh, related to diet. It's that uh, it's cheap. Sorry, is cheat day work? Does it work? Because uh, where I learn is from social media, and there are people saying different things. Okay, I, I go for gym. I try to be concerned on my health, but I always hear that people say cheat day can be maybe once a week, and people say don't have cheat day at all, and people say like maybe once a month, or like maybe once a year, or during vacation. So yeah, I hope yeah the two questions. Okay. Very very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think whoever wants to contribute, very very question though. Uh, <laughs> speaking as an employer too, right? Okay. Uh, maybe I can answer that question, and 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 really that depends. I mean, so this is a cultural thing, right? When when uh, and of course we're talking about women, uh, and also uh, in the in gender equality, and this also happens in sport. Mm. So when an athlete is married, more likely or most likely. The coach or, or 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 the country, I won't say who, but uh, they maybe will not put you in the list of selected athletes to represent Malaysia, right. because they I'm afraid they might get pregnant. They they feel that most more likely maybe the husband has some influence on the decision making for for maybe career maybe whatever. So uh, actually. To answer that question is tough because that really depends on the employer, the university, right? But I personally feel that if that whatever setting that uh, this person is going to, 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 to find a career or job doesn't support even, I mean, 
being married doesn't make you less capable, right? Being married, of course, you need to find a partner who supports you. Like for me, I, I'm married. I'm married to a Bulgarian, uh, <laughs> Eastern European. And I find that he's, he is more of a, uh, you know, in a family, you know, when you have kids, it's more of a, a partnership. It's not just my responsibility to take care of the kids. He plays a role as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to me, the marriage thing, uh, if... <laughs> I mean, if the company doesn't support that, because if you go for an interview and you and and you don't wear the ring, then after that they find out that you know you are you are married, and then you're gonna have a kid in like nine months, right? <laughs> then you know it, it it's not something that is again sustainable, you know, in terms of uh, long term working there as well. Yeah. So really, uh, I thought of that question. You know, it's a very hard question. I I've thought about that. You know, but it's a very hard question to to answer. And for the cheat day, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Okay, you go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, cheat days, right? Okay, it is, the rule of thumb is calorie in, calorie out in one day. Okay, so if let's say one day you can take about 1,800 calorie, for example, no matter if you cheat or don't cheat, if you exceeding it, you will store it as fat. So I, like, I know people who also do intermittent fasting, you fast so long, but then after that, you eat so much <laughs> and a high calorie, a very concentrated uh, kind of food and beverages, then end up the total calorie that day is still exceeding, so you don't really see result anyway. So it, it's at the end of the day, it's like how much you put in and how much you put out. So if you have a cheat day, but the cheat day is very like a good amount of portion that you don't overdo it because you don't want to crave so much, then one day it's just like boom. <laughs> You take everything, right? So that's why like, we tell people that you can still eat, you can just pre-plan it. Like, okay, let's say this week you want to eat um, roti chadai or KFC, and then you eat it, like how much are you eating it? And how many times? What do you pair it with? Is it like uh, water, mineral water, or is it like bottomless Coke? <laughs> right? So those kind of thing. And then do you do physical activity? Like basic things like walking. Do you walk at all that day? If you plan like, oh, I'm going to walk today. Like for me, if I crave for chocolate, like, oh, I'm going to work out later. Like, I'm just going to eat my chocolate. Mm -hmm. So I don't like, oh, I'm going to have to wait until next month. Then and then I'm like so craving. I'm going to go to the shelf and stop everything. <laughs> you know, you're like, it's like a revenge. So you don't want to go to that level. Does that answer? Yes. Okay, thank you. You don't want to spell that I am not married or have kids. <laughs> and I think I'm very lucky that I also don't. Um, I mean, and I, 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 yeah. So I think my employers are quite uh, uh, flexible. So I've been very lucky. But I mean, I think it's very unfortunate. I think generally, from a policy perspective, there needs to be better understanding and better planning. Because at the end of the day, it's resource planning, right? Now I run uh, uh, for my work. I, I I lead the country office, and we do resource planning every month. So. You know, I think, I think it goes both ways, right? For the employee to communicate clearly, frankly, but the employer must also have, you know, uh, manage an environment that doesn't alienate. Because then, that's how you lose talent, you know. Yeah. I'm sorry, real quick, as, a, as an employer, um, one of the things is, I always tell the people that we interview that you're interviewing me as much as I'm interviewing you. Right, so the, it works both ways, it's a two-way street. If you're feeling that y your life choices and your lifestyle and what it is, who you are as a person, is not conducive with our organization, that's absolutely fine, right? You know, and so that's the other component and the, again, about what you picked up culturally from the United States, but that's one of the things that we bring to what we do. It's a two-way street, you know. Um, we need you as an employee as much as you need us as an employer. And it's, it's more equal than I think people think it is, right? Like it's not one way or the other. That's just not. That's a very good perspective. I think we'll take one more question, but I would like to add to, to that extreme too, right? So we talk about work-life balance uh, and your career choices as being one of the things you evaluate. As an em employer, 
one of the things that I try to do is to be extremely transparent with the expectation of the role. Mm -hmm. Because it may not always be this role is going to be 9 to 5, you have your leave. Some roles are extremely demanding. And there are people out there who are looking for extremely demanding role in the stages we are trying to build their career. So my, my office, for example, is the most extreme. They work seven days a week as necessary. But the trade-off is that they get to be away whenever they want. Right? They get to fly with me wherever I go. They get unlimited exposure to anything they want. They have unlimited amount of claims for whatever they spend on. So some people will thrive on, on those policies because they are at a stage where they're trying to career build. And a lot of women, specifically, who are playing that role, actually the entire office is women, the, 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 the women who are playing that role is very conscious that they, are, they have a time bound. And this is what I don't like about that conversation. Most of them come to me and say, I need to build my career up to the point when I get married and have kids because then my career will stagnant. So that's why they're extremely aggressive in the early stages of it. And, and I don't like that conversation because they already imprinted in them that their career will stop growing after they have kid. Yeah, we're trying to find a way, and I don't think we know how, we're trying to find a way to, to make sure that their career doesn't stop just because they have a kid. And one thing that we realize is that we stop measuring people by the amount of hours they put in and start measuring it by impact. So you can be a parent and you can be extremely impactful even though you're working four hours a day. And I have some people that I'd rather have four, working for four hours than for, for four days. Right? So then it really changes the narration and conversation a little bit. Good, we have one more question. Before we wrap it up. Yeah, it is. No, no. Okay. Just real quick, um, everybody returned, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's 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 no agenda in that. Where I guess there might be hidden agenda is um, you came back and you had your friends that may not have left or they may have gone to the UK. What do you think were the biggest differences amongst your peers? Not just as far as trying to reacclimate to family, but what were the biggest differences with your age group and your peers, being that you had gone to school in the United States, now you're back in Malaysia, and just your mindset and way of thinking? You mean between us or our peers? Who went to the U.S.? Went to the U.S. Yeah, just oh, yeah. Right, right. So if you went, to, if you were here in high school, everybody left. Yeah. Everybody came back, and everybody was different. Yeah. yeah. What are the ways that you the were different? Peers. Yeah. Yes. Your friends. Like yeah, just your age group or whatever the circumstances. Oh, that's a very good question. I think. Uh, so number one, I went to high school in Sarawak. Right, a very small town, Miri, not even Kuching. Uh. We, were, we became a city in 2005. <laughs> yeah, it was a public holiday, I remember. <laughs> and uh, celebrities came and performed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, I grew up in a very small town, um, and, and I think 70% of my peers didn't even leave so Miri. What more study abroad? Um, and so, I think. And, and I, I haven't go back in years because my, my family has left Sarawak. But when I go, you know, I went back after like 10 years the other day and I'm like, it's, and my friends are, it's, it's very different, I think, from a small town, especially compared. It's, it's people marry each other, right? The community is tighter. They're, they're a lot more, uh, I think, grounded in their, in their community, in their families. Um, and they're less bothered about uh, the bigger picture, so to say. Not to say that they're not, they don't care, right? But it's a very interesting perspective and in, in how they uh, make their decision and their choices, which translates to like, you know, whether they send their kids to public school, private school, uh, whether they choose to start their own business in Miri or to look for opportunities in KL. Um, you know, you see very different um, um, perspectives and decisions that affect them. And I think also because a lot of Sarawakians, um, they're very family based. So, you know, it, it's a thing because my, my, we are not Sarawakians, we just moved there. And, 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 you know, I meet a lot of half Sarawakians who, who say that, you know, if you marry a Sarawakian, you will live in Sarawak. You know, you will not live in KL. It's just, it's, life is just better there. And, 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 and I see that, right? So they do end up settling down in Sarawak. They raise their kids in Sarawak. Um, uh, so, so that's that. But secondly, I think comparatively my peers, I would say now in a professional 
seen, right? I would say is the level of confidence that you see, even among US and UK grads, I think. Um, so when I ran Undi 18 for about five years full time, we would hire young people and we get applications from local grads, private grads, public, US, UK, all around. Um, and you can clearly see even in the interview, um, uh, interview stages, the way they uh, 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 present themselves, the way the confidence, and I think in a positive way, the audacity to present themselves is very different. Um, I think, and you can clearly see it's because of the education environment they were in, where like, you know, when they speak up, you don't have teachers that say, you know, don't, don't say anything, don't comment. It's, it's very clear uh, that, that that carries into adulthood and that carries into the workplace and you can see the stark difference. Of course, you have, you know, uh, some you know uh, 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 local grad that you can see definitely they're very confident. And then you look, you dig deeper in the debaters, their public speakers. <laughs> no, no, I have against the debaters. Although I know way too many debaters, but because they're in politics, you know, every you know, half the debaters end up in politics in Malaysia. So, 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 but, but you see, because they went an extra mile to to build that skill. But I think when you study in somewhere like the states, it's it's not something like extracurricular. The, 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 the expectation to be articulate and to, to be confident is, is built into um, our day-to-day -day, uh, lectures and, and classes, yeah. Mm. Um, I second both of that, actually. So definitely, um, when I came back, I did feel like I was a little bit more individualistic than my peers who made a lot of decisions, especially with regard to how they would maybe um, their relationships with their parents, very a lot more collective, whereas um, they might be quite different. Like initially, um, had a lot of debates with my parents, just like different views, which I think is healthy for the family unit. You know, we, a lot of people then start thinking differently and having more honest conversations, I think. Um, so I agree with both of that. I, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. But I had a, I had a thought actually when you were, the question is what is the main difference, right? With yeah. peers? re when you're mm. back mm. between US, UK, local grants. Yeah, I, okay, I, I remember now. I was going to say that I think it also somewhat depends on the experience of the Malaysian who went abroad. I think if they hung out mostly with Malaysians, I noticed yeah. that there's not a lot of difference. <laughs> But if they make friends with other international students or Americans, then they come back and I see a lot of difference. That, that makes, and also maybe what they study, because if you study liberal arts or general studies, or I study um, you know, public policy, a lot of the classrooms are centered around discussion. So you're meant to like, talk about how you feel, your perspective. But my husband studied data science. So his classes were primarily um, computer science, studied computer science and economics. So it was just, I was cooked in a library with other people trying to do pop sets, lah, is what he told me. You're trying to get my lens, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I think he was an RA, so that was what really, um, I think, really pushed him to hang out with different types of people. Um, so it really just depends, I think, on the community that you surround yourself with. So I do tell younger Malaysians who study in the US, I'm like, it's great to have your Malaysian friends, but try to push yourself beyond those boundaries, or else you don't get the full experience of exposure. Yeah, um, and one other thing is that I don't know, um, maybe it's the political awareness, but I do feel that compared to UK students, um, US grads tend to think a lot about this term impact. Like, and sometimes I mean the word can be a little bit uh, overused, lah, change maker, like impact, like all these things. <laughs> um, but I do feel like um, for some reason, lah, like, a lot of my friends who study in the US and came back, we tend to have more conversations about that than the friends that went to the UK. But that could just be um, a, a bubble or a niche, I don't know. But that's, that's my experience. Huh? I guess for my bubble, the, the, the two words that I would compare is, the, the word that I see a lot, at least in my field, is innovation coming from US grads mm, and yeah. achievement coming from UK grads. Mm. I think status is very important for the UK grads. Yeah, but I mean, also because there's less Malaysians in the US, mm. right? We, we don't meet Malaysians very often. At, at least, I, I mean, unless you study in like maybe Penn State uh, or, I don't know. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we, we used to call, you know, some places really Kampong Melayu, right? Like, <laughs> you know, where especially there's a lot of scholars in, in that area. But, but even then, in comparison, like, I remember when we were organizing the Midwest Games, 
um, back then. I don't know if they still have it now. But, oh, they still, oh, not bad. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Penn State would have one of the biggest delegations, right? And they would have, what, 200 Malaysians? And I was like, wow, so many people. And then I met UKEC and they're like, oh, we have like 3,000 Malaysians. And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then we charge every membership fees. I'm like, no wonder you all got so much money all the time. Right? And, and, then you, and I mean, the comparison of Malaysians experience in the UK and the US is so different. Sometimes you go to London, it's, it's like you never even left KL. Especially if you're upper middle class in KL already, right? I, I used to go, I went to London once for Teach for Malaysia for work. And someone on the street stopped me because they recognized me from Malaysia. And I'm like, I'm not in KL. How is someone recognizing me here? And I think same in Melbourne as well. There's so many Malaysians. Um, so I think it's, the US is a lot more unique in the sense where like, you know, when we travel on summer break, you meet, you see someone like in an Asian restaurant ordering like chili padi, you're like, maybe that's Malaysian. Because like, you know, other Asians probably won't know how to order that, right? It's like, okay, let's, let's go say hi or something. Let's just speak Malay loudly and see they respond or not, you know? <laughs> yeah, my dad does that. So, so I think that's also, you know, some, you know, I think something in the US, you are forced also to be in a, in a different environment, which is a good thing. And sometimes I think in the UK, it's like, you would, I, I know Malaysians who never talk to non-Malaysians while they live three, four years in London. Yeah. You don't need to, mm. right? It's a whole bubble there yeah, as the well. Commonwealth, the Commonwealth yeah, is, is yeah, real. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get out of there. I will challenge that one. I say, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I think with, with that, uh, we would love to wrap up the session for, for today. And really again, thanks so much, uh, Kira, Tania, so, uh, Sophia, and so Ilya for coming, volunteering your time, bringing up your Saturday evening and being together with us. And before we send you off and continue chatting and networking, we'd like to invite Mr. Ng for a small uh, token, a presentation of a token of opposition. Or oh, maybe I pass the stage back to Victor. Okay. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Chan Liao, and thank you, uh, Kira, Tanya, uh, Ifa, and also Sophia. We appreciate it. Um, it's a real fun session, and thank you all uh, as well for attending the session. Um, it was an honor to have you right here. I hope you had fun uh, as well like, on panel. So thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you for organizing. Thank you so much. And with that in mind, um, so do hang around uh, for a quick bit. For now, uh, we'd like to ask Mr. Ng, President of the UAM, to pre present a couple of uh, tokens of appreciation to everyone here. Yeah. yeah thank, you. thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I know you're taking your private time off for, for our event here. Uh, I think we, we also want to acknowledge from the embassy, Mira Mira is from Education USA. Thank you for being here. She has been very supportive. Okay, um, we have a little token. We're talking about uh, loving Malaysia, so patriotic. <laughs> so Nasi Lama has to be here. And nutrition, Nasi Lama most nutritionist. So, okay, come. Everybody got one, so. Oh, just there. Oh, it's hiding in plain sight. Amazing. 